Good morning, everybody. Wonderful to see you. We want to welcome our Greece campus. Those who are joining us online, let me just look at you for just one second. You look spectacular. It's so good that you are here. Thank you if this is your second time in. Don't sit down. I'm watching. I'm watching. I'm just messing with you. Let me pray for us. Jesus, you are so wonderful. Ah, beyond the all imagination. For you loved us first. When we were yet sinners, hiding from you, throwing tantrums, confused. And we often go to those places. You love us. You love us then, and you, loves us, you love us now. So today, Holy Spirit, thank you that you are here as a gift from heaven to interpret what God wants to say to us, his people. Not only do you help us understand, but you soften our hearts to believe. I pray that the, the seed of your word that is spurred in life will fall on good soil today, O oh God, and mixed in with faith that will produce a lot of fruit. God, I thank you that those who are feeling weary, those who are in a place of strain, those who are in, in, the, in the storms raging, that they will just find a time of comfort and rest and know that you've already been in their outcomes. So thank you, Father, for loving us as your people so deep. In Jesus' name, amen. Oh, you may be seated. Thank you so, so, so very much. <clears throat> I'm so excited um, to be here with you. As they already said, um, this coming Thursday is our heart and soul, and our heart and soul evenings. We do one of those each quarter, and it is absolutely amazing. If you love um, coming here, and you go like, man, I love this place. is amazing. I'm excited to come. Um, and every time I go away, I come back, because there is something just beautiful about this. I want to encourage you to make the time on Thursday night, and Bring your after-party shoes because nobody can do the electric slide like these people can do the electric. That's all I'm going to say. I want to say we, we know how to celebrate and we're going to be celebrating um, what God has done and all the, East, the beautiful Easter stories and then pointing to where we go in just a little bit. And then we are going to have a ton of fun. Bring your kids. There's, there's some great fun planned for them. But before, before I, I go on, uh, I love Easter because Easter always comes with a sense of, of creativity. Um, so I looked up some church signs, um, church lawn signs during Easter. And I want to show you a few. So let's get the first one up there. Um, welcome back for the first of your two visits this year. Come on. How many know people like that? Come on. You know. Like. God loves his peeps. Go Trinity Baptist. Let's see the next one. Nobody loves you like Jesus. Happy Easter. Uh, let, let's go to the next one. It's not about the bunny. It's about the lamb. Oh, yeah. Oh, you preached that. <laughs> That's the lamb. Silly rabbit. Easter is for Jesus. Go victory. The Easter bunny didn't ra rise from the dead. Take that home. Man, the Baptist is loading this up. This is my favorite. Don't forget, Judas also left early. <laughs> Boom. I love that one. I'm just going to mount it at the end of the service. Just show it. <laughs> Judas left early. I love it. It's awesome. So today we're going to be speaking on a subject called No Greater Love. And I want to encourage you to take out your smartphone. Um, because you do know, when you, when you record notes and you make notes, and I know your mind goes like, no, 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 I just want to listen. Um, if you make notes, your attention is far greater. You can go back to it. And you give the Holy Spirit a far greater chance to remind you of what you write down than what you remember. 
Because some of you can't even remember what you had for breakfast this morning. How the heck are you going to remember what God really is going to say? Because there's usually something that you hear that's just for you. Everything else will disappear, but you go like, this is why I came. This one thing. So there is a question that I would love for you to answer. And this is for real, so don't fake it out, okay? We're going to work with this thing. If you had to complete this statement, what would you fill in with a missing blank? My aim in life is. My aim in life is. What, what would that word be? Now, while you're thinking of that word, um, let me tell you that Whatever you are thinking right now, they tell us there is a dominant life principle that we all live with, whether you know it or not. So for most people, that is a subconscious deciding factor. And the definition of a dominant life principle is simply this, is what you refer to unconsciously every day when you have multiple choices and you have decisions to make. In other words, let me phrase it this way. If, for instance, my dominant life principle is fun and I get two invites on the same day, guess which one I'm going to go for? The one that's more, and it's not deep. Turn to your neighbor and say, it's not deep. We'll work with it. If your dominant life principle is security, you'll go for the thing that's less danger. If your dominant life is more comfort, you'll go for the easy one. If your dominant life principle is to be recognized, You'll find out where's the most people in the party. If there's 10 there and there's 50 there, you go here. Because you need a crowd. You love to be recognized. Now, knowing your dominant life principle, probably that you don't know it, but it's there. I'm going to give you a few words to help you. Because I don't want a phrase. I want one word. Um, my aim in love, life, could it be success, comfort, recognition, to be well-known, happiness, security, fun, approval. But here's what I want you to do with me. Come on. Greece Campus, Charlie Campus, those who are joining us online. Don't write down what you wish you had. You, you go like, I, it's, it's very quiet all of a sudden. <laughs> don't, don't write down what you wish you had. It's not going to help you. Because I wish... Mine look different one than what it is. Uh, uh, write down and look back and say, where did I spend my time? Where did I spend my money? What makes me happy? What do I do all the time? What am I driving back to? What is that one thing? I want you to decide it real quick. You've got to, you've got to, you've got to, you've got to. Everybody decide. Are you ready? Are you ready? Everybody repeat with me. I cannot lie in the house of God. Jesus is watching, and thunder is real. Okay, I want you to turn to the person next to you and just tell them what your life principle. What is that word? What is that? No, 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 you've got it, you've got it. You're in church. The doors are locked. The, the bouncers are already there. You are in the pit, baby. Come on. Charlie, Grease Campus, online. Just tell people what it is. Tell them what it is. Tell them what it is. Tell them what it is. What is that? What is that thing? What is that thing? So, so I'll tell you mine. Mine is not to live a forgettable life. So any given time in the day when it feels boring, I want to go do something reckless. Because I don't want this day to go by and it's forgettable. I will chase geese if I can. I'll do anything to go home at night and go like, this is an awesome day. So boredom is as terrible to me as death. The moment I sit around and it's like quiet, something in me dies. Is it right or wrong? No, it's just plain stupid, but it's, that's me, right? Now, if God had to stand right here, and he had to articulate to us, what is the aim of life? You do know he doesn't have limited perspective like you and me. Because you and I look at life from the day that you were born to the day you die. For some, it is 70 years. For some, it's 50 years. We do not know what that is. And this is what they tell us, that we get very clear on the real aim of life 
when we sit in the sun in the shadow years of our lives and all we have is memories and regrets. In that moment, we are very clear what the aim of life is. The only problem is it is too late. When you, when you like right there at the end, you go like, now I get it. Good for you. But it's too late. So when God looks at this, you know, God doesn't start with your birth. He says, I knew you when you're in your mother's womb. And I had plans on you for great things. You know God doesn't stand right at the end of your life and go like, whoa, another one just died. Wow. No, no, no. For God, that is a glimpse, a, a, a blimp on a, on, on a pause of transition into the narrative of forever, the eternity, the infinity of everything. So for God, the question is not just a 60 or 80 year question. The question is a forever question. So he would say, what matters for life? Now, in the first book of Corinthians chapter 14, verse 1, we're going to read it. And I'm going to encourage you, please preach with me. It's going to be so fun. If you're quiet, I'm going to go just double the time. And it's horrible and, and it's not fun. This is what Paul says. And this is not Paul's opinion. This is what he says. God is inspiring me to write this for you to know. Come on, let's read it out loud. Make love your greatest aim. I want you to say it again. Make love your greatest aim. Now I'm going to sit down because for how many of you go like, oh boy, Oprah, this is like, like love. Oh. Now I, I'm going to take you a little bit further in this. Because in order to understand the rest of the weightedness that God wants to articulate to you and I, so that we don't get to our later years and we regret that we placed it in the wrong places. Listen, I have been pastoring people for a long time. I have seen people chase things. They lose their families. They lose their salvation. They lose their church family. They lose their sanity to arrive at what they thought it was only to find out when you touch it, it is candy floss. It disappears in your mouth. There's no taste. It gives you a week-long sugar high, and then it's empty. And when you look around, it is a mess. So we've got to understand when God talks about the aim, it's that thing when you live it. You live a purposeful life here and forever after. Now to understand it, you've got to understand the context of who the letter was written to to understand the weightedness of each of those words. What we're going to read is a letter that was written to the church in Corinth. Everybody shout Corinth. Corinth. Now I'm going to give you a little bit of a history lesson then you're going to understand the rest of the message. Can you just tell the person next to you, please don't sleep. Don't, don't die on the history lesson. Don't. Because you, you, you've got to understand. And I'll, I'll go quick with the history lesson. Let me give you some stuff about Corinth. The city of Corinth was a thriving city. It was in the time of that time, the chief city in Greece, both in commercially and political power. Right? The culture was a typical Greek culture. And what we understand by a typical Greek culture, that there was a very high adherence to Greek philosophy and Greek, what is the, what is the other one? Um, mythology, right? And they placed a very high premium on the mind, wisdom, knowledge, because that shaped their world. I can tell you something else about their religion. In Corinth, there were 12 temples. The most infamous was the temple to the goddess of love, Aphrodite. Now, those who worship Aphrodite practice religious prostitution. That is insane. It was so immoral in Corinth they say that because it's a commercial city and so many people travel through that it had unbridled immorality. Now the worship of Aphrodite had a thousand temple prostitutes that would serve the people who come to temple. I'm going to say this carefully. I don't think they ever had an attendance problem. I'm only saying, don't write me, it's just my reflection. Now, it was so bad 
that there was a Greek verb. This is the Greek verb. To corinthesize. Corinthesize. It means to practice sexual immorality. In other words, it was so known that they actually had a verb, a slang for it. Now, in the midst of this city, there was this young church called the Church of Corinth. Paul came and he preached the gospel of Jesus. And I can tell you that the church was established in power. Because in a place that is so dark, the light of God becomes cataclysmic in saving people. Not only were they saved, but they received the gift of the Holy Spirit. And everything that went on with it, so their faith was not a silent faith. It had visible manifestations of signs and wonders and people practicing the gift of the Holy Spirit. And the Bible says, Paul even wrote to them and said, you can't speak in tongues and prophesy every time you come together because people on the outside don't understand what's going on. In other words, they were so enamored with the gift. Hold on to that. The second thing is they had mountain moving faith because in order to stand in a place that is so wicked, you, you can't have almost faith. You've have got a conviction faith, mountain-moving faith. And the last thing that we understand, that they live under persecution all the time. In other words, to be a Christian was not easy. To be a Christian came at a high price. Now that you understand this, there are five things that Paul is writing to us. These are the things that God speaks about the aim of love as the greatest pursuit of your life and my life. Are you guys ready? Yeah. Oh, come on, just five things. Come on, are you guys ready? Yeah. Here is the first one. We just heard that eloquence of speech was held with the greatest, seen as the greatest of all human power. The power of the spoken word literally shaped what they believed, shaped what they fear, shaped what they knew. The, the words... And the power of words, eloquence of words, was held. And people wish they had it because whoever was eloquent in speech and that powerful speech could sway and mold and shape people's lives during that time. And as a matter of fact, even to this day, the power of speech is very powerful. That's why they say the tongue is mightier than the sword. Get it? Now listen. What Paul is writing. 1 Corinthians 13 verse 1. I want you to read it out loud. Turn to your neighbor and say, if I don't hear you, I'm going to point to you. I want you to be loud. Okay, here we go. If I speak with human eloquence and angelic ecstasy, but don't love, I am nothing but the creaking of a rusty gate. Listen, write this down. Without love, whatever I say, is ineffective and it's noise. Wow, think about it. That's why it is so interesting when people begin to argue about faith and the people who think and say they know the truth become nasty human beings. I tell you now, you don't believe me, you go straight to hell. And God, really, really? Bible says it's like because if love doesn't center your truth, then your truth is just noise to somebody's heart. Come on, you know that is true. The second thing that Paul is writing in verse 2, he says this, let's read together. Come on, Greece campus. If I have the gift of prophecy, stop right there. That's a big thing for the church and can fathom the mysteries and all the knowledge. That is the gift of those philosophers and those people with wisdom and knowledge. He says, if I have all of this. Now, I thought about back then, how much did they really know? How much knowledge did they really carry? So I found this interesting article on the Buck Minister Fuller that created a knowledge doubling curve. Now, you go like, what is him and what is this? You're going to love this. Until 1900, human knowledge doubled every 100 years. Uh, keep, keep the track. 1900, every 100 years. After the Second World War. You know when that was, like 2 September 1945? 
How do I know that? Googled it. That's what I did. 1945, you know what they say? Knowledge doubled every 25 years. Now think what is happening. It's speeding up. Now today, it's difficult to point to do just one thing because there are different types of knowledge and different rates. Here's nanotechnology. That is the manipulation of matter on an atomic molecular level. You knew that, right? Of course, why would we not know that? You know how quickly that doubled every two years. Every two years, the book that you had three years ago, throw it away because knowledge just doubled. On average, clinical knowledge doubles every 18 months. The average human knowledge doubles every 13 months. And IBM predicted with the internet that knowledge will double every 12 hours. And you know when this article was published? 2013. Can you imagine the speed of information right now? And you know what Paul is saying? 1 Corinthians 8 verse 1, come on, read this with me. He says, we know that all of us possess knowledge, but knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. In other words, what Paul is saying, without love, all that I know is incomplete. All that I know is incomplete. Number three. Paul is writing 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 2, the, the second portion. He says, if I had the gift of faith, so I could speak to a mountain and make it move, I would still be worth nothing at all without love. In other words, what Paul is saying, so many of us feel if our faith produced signs and wonders and, and earth-shaking things, if, if our faith is so powerful that we can share it with the world because we are standing here because of faith. You came to church because of faith. But Paul says if our earth-shaking faith is not enveloped in love, then it is worth nothing to us and to the world. Here is the fourth one. Don't you never say there's only five. We're rolling, baby. We're rolling. There's only five. Paul's writing. He says in 1 Corinthians 13, verse 3, if I give all I possess to the poor. Now, let me stop right there. How many of you would be honest enough to say, it would really be hard to give everything I have away today? Come on, let me see. All the honest people are raising their hands right now. I don't think anybody. Do you know it's a hard thing even that young, rich young man that said to Jesus, I do everything and more. Jesus says, give everything away. The Bible says he turned away, sad, because it is a hard thing. Now, the Bible says this. Even if you and I come to a conclusion that it's possible for us to give things away, we can give everything away because we all give. And giving is not always easy. And I want you to know that's why giving and love is so closely related. That's why the Bible says God loves cheerful givers. The moment you begun, begin to growl every time you've got to give, your wife says, hey, let's, let's be kind to some of you. And you're like, oh, how much do you want? Then, no, this is, it's, it's terrible giving right there. If, if you, you feel like giving to the church, but every time you give, you drive home and you are growling. No, because you see, we all give for different reasons. Some give to have a plaque somewhere where everybody can see that they are generous. Some give to manipulate. Have you ever received a present and you're too scared to open because you know, what does that mean once I open this? Come on. You go like, why would they give this to me? Because I know if I say thank you, they owe me. Uh, parents, sometimes we don't understand, but we give to control our children. We give. We, we know how to play that game. But, but at the end of the day, whether our giving is good or our giving is not bad, let me tell you something about giving. And I would write this down. You can give without loving, but you cannot love without giving. Oh, that's huge. You can give without loving, but you cannot love without giving. And I'm just going to speak just for one moment. With those of you who are dating right now, just, just because I love you. If you have somebody that says they love you, 
but they make you pay every time you go anywhere. I know the guys go like, who the heck are you to tell me that? <laughs> well, I'm almost six foot tall and I'm standing on the stage. That's who I am. <laughs> because I can tell you this, that love will cause you to be reckless in giving to the one you love. That's why scripture says God loved us so recklessly much that he gave all that heaven had. The highest price of heaven was the son of God. If he could give an angel as a highest price, he would have given an angel. But God had to go to the highest thing that came closest to his heart. He gave his only son. And I'm here to tell you, sweetheart, if you want to have a life being married till the end of time, you better get someone who dangerously gives into your life i'm sticking with that story right now and i'm moving on because i can tell you this ladies i guarantee you and you it's a good time to preach with me right now if you had to choose between being deeply bathed in your husband's love all the time or to have no love but a nice car and a nice home where would you go uh, please say love please say love otherwise if we, we've got bigger problems in this place than just that. Because I can tell you, no car, no house can make up when love is cold, when you hug a block of ice, where you've got a beg for affection. It doesn't matter. It do I'll rather live in a tent than to live in a palace where there is no love. So Paul is making it simple. If all I give does not, it's not covered with love, it is insignificant and useless giving. Number five, come on, Ian. Number five, we are right here, baby. We are right here. Turn to the person next to you and say, you are doing so well. We're almost done. Love sitting next to you. Love, 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 love. Paul is writing, and he says, here is the big thing. 1 Corinthians 13, verse 3. If I were burned alive for preaching the gospel, but I didn't love others. I don't know anybody I know a lot of pastors. God has allowed and created so many open doors. I know people and pastors that love Jesus and work hard on so many continents. And I can tell you this, I have never met a pastor who died as a martyr. Never. Yet BBC, there's an article on BBC that says, astonishing to us in safe places there are more than a hundred thousand Christians that are martyred for their faith every year we have brothers and sisters across the globe that their faith means that they may have to die for that now when we look at the disciples and they became apostles how many of you have ever said, I would have loved to be one of Jesus' disciples? Come on, let's be honest. You go like, dude, that would be awesome. I want to see dead people come to life. I want to like see bread and fish multiplied and, and he multiplies the wine and the party doesn't stop. I want to see all this stuff. The question is, are you ready to live it to the extent where you will have to Die for what you believe. Because Peter was crucified upside down in Rome. You know why? Because he says, I'm not worthy to be crucified like Jesus. He died a crucifixion death. Andrew. Andrew was scourged, then tied rather than nailed to the cross. They say that he was, they, he was hanging there for two days. And you know what they said he did for two days? He preached the gospel of forgiveness and, and love. And many came to faith while he was giving up his life. I like this guy. Ever heard of James? Now James was killed with a sword and the accuser 
that got him in prison and killed was so impressed with his courage that he came to faith and opted to die with James by the sword. Philip was crucified. Bartholomew, he had the worst deal out. Bartholomew was crucified, taken down, skinned alive, and beheaded. Matthew, oh Thomas, he was killed. Somebody ran a spear through him. Matthew was stabbed in the back by a swordsman. Jude, crucified. Simon, crucified. The only one that died a peaceful death was the Apostle John. You go like, why are you saying this? It's freaking me out. It's such a downer. I know. But you know what scripture says? Even if your name was among them and you do not have love as your aim, the fragrance of your life, it doesn't matter. Come on. Husbands, let me talk to you, all the guys in this place. Nobody teaches us the point system, but I know, you know what I'm talking about. If your wife says, take out the trash, how many points is taking out the trash? Come on, work with me. For me, it's at least 20 points, the trash. If my ma wife says, can you go wash my car? Oh, that's 50 straight right there. That's, you go like, what's the points about? Well, when, whenever it gets dark at night, I come with like 400 points. You know what I mean? I go, hey, baby, I got points, big points. Come on, men. Amen. Yes. May the Lord bless you and me. How many points do you think you get when you are murdered for your faith? I go, like, that's 50,000. Attending church is 20. God says, there's no points if love. It's not who you are, what you are, the fragrance of your soul. And the more I say this, the more I feel terrible about me. The more I go like, oh, damn, I stink so bad. Because some people, it's almost born loving. Anybody know it? But my wife's born loving. You see her like, oh, she just loves. That's why I married her. So we get points together. But I'm, like, I'm not that way. I love you when I feel safe with you. But if you check me out, I check you out. You know what I mean? Come on, talk with me. Somebody in front of me and they're possessed by the devil clearly on the road. It's hard for me to love. I want to go by them. That's why I drive a big car and go like, really, really. Come on, there's human in me. There's human in you. And I'm like, what is this love that God is talking about? Otherwise, I'm in trouble. The love that God talks about is different than the love that we think. And next week, I cannot begin to tell you about that love because that love manifests in beautiful ways. So turn to your neighbor and say, I'm keeping you a seat. If you don't come, I'm going to find you. You can keep a seat. Come on. A Greece campus, tell the people, I'm going to keep you a seat. But here is the part that I can tell you, and I want to write this down. I'm done. I'm done. Look, look, look. I'm done. This is what I can tell you. Write this down. Love is an effect. Love is an effect. Come on, shout it out. Love is an effect. No, 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 let's do it. Love is an effect. Come on. Love is an effect. Uh, one more time. Come on, Greece campus. Love is an effect. What does it mean? It means that love is as a result of something. Love is not just love. It's not goosebumps. You don't sing like, oh, I feel so loved right now. No, it's an effect of something else. When I hold my wife, I feel love because of her. She is the effect of that specific love that I feel. And the best way I can describe it is my life and your life is an iron. And we put it to a source of electricity. Induction takes place from the electricity to the iron, and now the iron is electrified because of the induction to the source of electricity. If you get that, say yes. If I take your life and my life and we are just um, iron bars and we put it next to a gigantic magnet, all of a sudden, because we are connected to a magnet, we become magnetized. Without the source, we are but a piece of iron. I want you to know that 
scripture is very clear in 1 John 4 19 is my second last scripture everybody out loud read it out loud we love because he oh we love because he first loved us you see our proximity to love is what will cause us to be induction of his love in other words I'm going to make the statement it is not real love if you are far removed away from the source of love. It's human love, erotic love, romantic love, affectionate love. It's like love, like love, love, like. But the love of God is an unconditional love. It's a love um, that is not self-seeking. And the only way that we ever begin to experience that love is when we are close to the source. And we're going to talk about it. How do I stay close to the source so that love that flows through me is the God kind of love, not the me making it up kind of love? Here is the final story. But before I tell it, can you just... Turn to your neighbor and say, you've been so great. I love, I love sitting next to you. And you know you're just buying me three minutes right now. Matthew 25 says that one day he will sit on his throne in all of his glory and gather all the nations in front of him. He will divide them. On his right, he'll put the sheep. On his left, he'll put the goats. Everybody that says, dang, I want to be a sheep so bad, shout yes. yes. And he would look at the sheep and say, welcome in to all of my glory. Faithful. Then he'll look at the goats and he says, go away. Cast them into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. Let me ask the question again. Who would like to be sheep right now? Anybody that says, man, I can't wait to be a goat. You need therapy. That's all I'm going to say. That's all I'm going to say. So my question is, I want to be a sheep so bad. So Jesus if I stand before you, what determines whether I'm a sheep or a goat? I know giving my life to you. I think living my life, is it going to be that the things that count for me is my theology and my conviction and my faithfulness, my prayer books, my journals? Are you going to count the amount of times I'm on my knees praying for other people? Is it the eloquence of my speech or the generosity of my heart? Jesus, is it my willingness to die for my faith? W what is it that's going to be on the scale that's going to determine all of this? And Jesus would tell you, and no, no. What's going to show up that day is the poor and the hungry, the naked and imprisoned, the water that you did not give. Because the goats are going to go like, hey, 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 time out. Why the heck am I a goat? And Jesus said, when I was hungry, you didn't give me no food. When I was thirsty, you looked the other way. When I was in prison, you never came to see me. When I was cold, you never gave me any warmth. And they would go, Jesus, when were you in prison? When were you? Psh, gee, come on. Jesus says these words. What you've done to the least of these You've done it unto me. What am I saying? I don't want you to go like guilt, guilt, and go like, oh gosh, I'm, I'm, I'm terrible. No, 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 no. You know what it is? It's the law of love. It's the law of love. Love will be the judge. Love. That's why Jesus says, by this shall all men know that we are his disciples. If we love, we're the inductors of his love to the work world we are in. When you are the very expression of the love of God where you work, you are the expression of love of God in your home. You are the expression of 
God's love in your marriage. You are the expression of God's love in hard places. Not because you are great. It's because you are holding on to the very source of life and allowing His love to be inducted through you in that way. So 1 Corinthians, make love your greatest aim. Because Jesus says all the commandments are wrapped up in one commandment. You will love the Lord your God with all of your heart, all of your soul, all of your mind, all of your strength and your neighbor has yourself. This commandment of love wraps up all the other commandments and if you love, you will obey all the other commandments. I want us to bow our heads right now. I cannot wait for next week. Right now, whenever every hair is bowed, and remember, Jews, Judas left first. Don't go, right? Just stay. Greece, just stay in this moment. I want to get as close as you as possible right now. Because I want to remind you, the Bible says that all of us, have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Sin brings separation. And there is nothing as terrible as ongoing separation from the life giver and the source of life. But the Bible says we could do nothing about that. That what, why God sent His Son Jesus. So that He could rectify the distance of separation. So that we who were once far can now come near. He says, and not only will I bring proximity, but I will take that stubborn heart that you have. And I will birth it anew and give you a heart of obedience in love. That's why he says, to inherit the kingdom, you must be born again. It's a sovereign work of God's Holy Spirit. But he says, it's not heart. I'm knocking at your heart. And if you open your heart and invite me in, if you call upon my name, I will save you. I prayed this prayer. I made this decision when I was 13 years old. And maybe today you are sitting here and you can feel the Holy Spirit work on the inside of you. I do not have the power to talk you into salvation. I can only touch where God has pre-touched already. That's why he says, when you hear my voice, don't harden your heart. You are sitting in our campuses right now and online. You say, Pastor Peer, there is a separation between me and God right now. I know it. I believe in him. But I have no intimate relationship with him. But today, I feel the, the gentle nag of the Holy Spirit that says, come on home, baby. Come on home. If that is you. I'm not going to ask that you come to the front, but that you just simply raise your right hand and drop it so I know who I'm praying for. If you say, that's me, just raise your hand. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you for the hands back there. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Everybody else, Pastor Chris, your team can get ready. Anybody else? 15 more seconds. Thank you for that hand. Thank you, thank you for this hand. Thank you. It's such a big decision. I'm going to lead us all in a prayer in all of our campuses right now. And I'm going to ask the Father's House Church family to pray this out loud with me. There is no power in what we say, but it's faith in a God that is ready to rescue our lives. And I'm going to ask those who raise their hands and those who join us online that responded. To pray this loud enough that your own ears can hear. And to believe that God is a promise keeper right now. So let's just pray this prayer. Say, Heavenly Father, I come to you in Jesus' name. I hear the voice of your Spirit. And today I respond. I surrender my life. And I'm inviting you in. Jesus, come. Take my stubborn heart and give me a brand new heart of obedience. Wash me clean. Make me whole. You said if I call upon your name, 
you'll save me. I believe you're the Son of God that died for my sin, raised from the dead. And you said all who receive you will become sons and daughters of God. Because you're a promise keeper. I believe my life will never be the same again. Thank you for loving me first. In Jesus' name, amen. Pastor Chris, I'm going to pass it back to you in Greece. May God bless you guys. Now here in this room, Pastor Luke's going to come up. But if you raised your hand, you don't have to. I'm going to be right there in the corner with a bunch of beautiful people that would love to take a moment and do a prayer with pray a simple prayer with you and give you a gift in hand, a Bible and a journal and all the next opportunities for you to continue to grow in your faith. You don't have to. But I promise you, if you take the courage to do that, my desire is that you go from believing to thriving in your faith. And I cannot wait to see